It's episode 205 of the Author Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Hank Garner. Join me each week on Tuesdays and Fridays for new episodes of the Author Stories Podcast, interviews with the very best authors in publishing today. Find all the archives at hankgarner.com, and when you're there, please subscribe. It helps other people find the show. I'd like to thank some sponsors this week. Uh, Dominion Rising, 23 all-new novels of fantasy and science fiction. Uh, Thousands and thousands of pages in this set uh, that is destined to be the biggest blockbuster set of the summer. It releases in just a couple of weeks, but you can get your pre-order in for only 99 cents. There's a link in the show notes. Dominion Rising. Go pick up your copy today. Also, Galactic Satori Chronicles by Nick Breaker and Paul E. Hicks. When a thirst for revenge sends one man on a deadly journey through the galaxy in the adrenaline-pumping new novel, Galactic Satori Chronicles. There are two installments out now, Book 1 Earth and Book 2 Quran, some of the very best page-turning science fiction available. There's a link to it in the show notes. My good buddy Ed Gosney at his blog at edgosney.com runs one of the best comics blogs, cool comics in my collection. Uh, Go read it each week. I do. I think you'll learn something, and uh, maybe it'll turn on uh, your desire to collect comics again. Or like me, go back and revisit some of those storylines that you missed from when you were a kid. Uh, Also, uh, I just found out that Ed's book, Transmutations, uh, there's an audio book available now. This is a fantastic book, and I think you'll really love it. Go pick up the audio book of Transmutations. As always, we're going to have an audio clip at the end of the show uh, for Richard Glebe's The Jason Crane series, and uh, I think you're going to love it. There's a link to it in the show notes. Uh, One more thing before we get started on our show. Uh, A couple of months ago, I was invited to DragonCon as a a media guest to uh, come cover the event. But I got an email over the weekend uh, saying that they had listened to the show and had been following the show and uh, were going to uh, escalate that invitation. Uh, if you will, and uh, allow author stories to have a very prominent role in covering it. And they're going to provide us with a room uh, with lighting and backdrops and all of that kind of stuff to do video interviews and give us access to their Walk of Fame uh, guests, which are, you know, kind of the the big names that draw people to these cons. Uh, So I would love your help uh, in doing this uh, to really cover the event like we really want to and to do it justice. I need to buy some new equipment and uh, need to cover some travel costs and stuff like that. So there's a link in there where you can help be an executive producer for the Dragon Con coverage. Everyone that donates gets an executive producer credit in all of that coverage. And uh, we've had some very generous folks so far. We're making a dent in it. We still have a ways to go, though. So uh, thank you for supporting the show. If you've learned something or gotten some motivation from the show, uh, please show your love and support at paypal.me slash author Hank Garner. Now on to our show. The world is dying at the hands of a brutal empire. Brother Dust, a changeling born amidst a sandstorm, has seen it all before. He's watched as the heavy imperial boots have crushed dozens of planets, watched as their drills pierce the core of a world, slowly killing it while the natives are kept docile and compliant with the gifts and pleasures the Empire brings from the stars. He will watch no more. Brother Dust will use his ability to mold his own body into devastating weapons to wage a one-man war against the malevolent High Father and the Empire's diabolical machines. The body count is rising, but the Empire must be stopped. From the writing team of Steve Bowyer and Aaron Hall comes Brother Dust, the Resurgence. Pick it up today on Amazon.com. Brother Dust, the Resurgence.
Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. I'm really excited to have Mike Cole uh, on the show today. Mike is one of these individuals that uh, if you like his writing and you start uh, looking him up uh, like I did, you start realizing that, man, this is a guy uh, that is so uh, much deeper than his uh, than maybe his writing persona. And uh, those are the folks I love to talk to. So uh, welcome to the show, thanks Mike. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. Um, I begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or a storyteller? Oh, man, that's uh, – I, I wonder, do you get a lot of guests who have to think about that? Because for – Yes, <laughs> I know. I know exactly what it is. I don't have to think about it for one second. Um, my mom bought me. Um, if you remember the old Ralph Bakshi animated Lord of the Rings, long long oh, yeah. before Peter Jackson, you know, revolutionized our vision of it. Long even before I think Alan Lee's watercolors kind of conceptualized it in my mind. Um, she bought me the vinyl record of of it being narrated, kind of like you know the old Neanderthal version of an audio book. And in it was... I had that same record. Oh, you did? <laughs> yes. Do you remember the... Yes, we got it. We got it from a uh, our local library. Uh, had a, uh, you know, kind of how they have these sales once a year where they get rid of old stuff. And I bought it for like 25 cents or oh, something. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, it's crazy. All right, well, cool. Yes. Well, I don't know if you remember, but it had these really excellent liner notes. Basically, it was a, it was a, a script... Of you know all the dialogue and sound effects in the in the record, and it had illustrations from the animated show. And I I remember very clearly getting this from mom, taking it up to my room, asking for pen and paper, and then hand copying word for word that whole script. I really don't remember what possessed me to do it, but I did it and I stuck with it. And then I came back downstairs and gave it to my mom and told her I wrote a book. And uh, it never went away you know and that that impulse to, to to do stuff like that never went away and there's a temptation to think of it as more than the capricious whim of a little kid you know to think of like fate being at work but the truth is that uh I, you know i've been alive long enough to know that sometimes you know shit just happens <laughs> hey is it it is okay to curse on the show right Absolutely. Ever since uh, Patrick Rothfuss came on the show, um, I've had an explicit uh, tag on iTunes because uh, after the 17th uh, F-bomb, I just... Yeah, fair up, enough, so. fair enough. I pre- well, yeah. I, would, I would like to <laughs> formally thank Pat for blazing the trail because I swore like a sailor because right. I am one. Well, that that's all right. You know, I, I just want you to be who you are on the show. I, that's, I that's am one foul mouth dude. That's who I am. So you you obviously were bitten by the bug early, and uh, why why do you think it was it was fantasy? You know, Lord of the Rings that uh, that kind of grabbed you initially. Um, you know, it wasn't just Lord of the Rings, and I know specifically why it was fantasy. And uh, I, look, uh, this isn't a knock at my parents. You know, they were dealing with whatever they were dealing with. But the truth is that I wasn't really raised. There wasn't a lot of parenting going on for me. Um, and of course, when you when you're a young kid, especially a young guy. Um, You know, you have a lot of a lot of questions and a lot of fear. And I didn't have any male role models to teach me how to be, you know, a male. So what I did was turn to media and what media is available to to young kids that are looking around to see, you know, what a man look like. Well, we have comic books, we have role playing games. At least that's what I had. So I was kind of reared by. Superman and Batman and by the fighter characters in Dungeons and Dragons and by Lord of the Rings. And, and when you're scared all the time, you know, you, you look to see what men who are not scared are doing. And in all the fantasy representations there are basically with very few exceptions, the answer is violence is that the reason that Wolverine and Spider-Man are not scared is because they can, you know, beat the tar out of anybody who scares them. And uh, granted, I'm aware of how, like, twisted that sounds. Um, but the truth is, is that it, it wound up, in the end, being enfranchising for me. It did turn me into a bully very briefly, and I'm not proud of that. But I came out on the other side of it um, as someone really, really committed to the profession of arms and, um, and to the study of warfare, which has benefited me not only in my professional career in law enforcement and military and intelligence, but also now I'm doing military history uh, at a professional level. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely baggage that drove me to, the, to those choices. 
but um, ultimately it's baggage that brought me to a place I'm pretty happy with. So it's not a sad story for me. Yeah. Uh, and I want to uh, dig into those professional pursuits in just a minute, but um, what part of the country were you raised in? Uh, I am a nice Jewish boy uh, from the suburbs of New York City in Westchester. Uh, Hartsdale, White Plains, uh, anybody who uh, knows New York will be rolling their eyes right now. These are considered to be the sort of pampered, you know, uh, high-end commuter suburbs uh, outside the city. Gotcha. Um, did... Uh, did growing up in an area like that, uh, you said you played, uh, you know, role playing games and stuff. Did you have a, you know, a, a pretty good big group of friends that uh, that also liked to game and, and you know, were you able to form a group, uh, you know, of kids that hung together and kind of raised? No, each other? that's what no, it was. No, not at all. In fact, um, I really, I didn't learn basic social skills. Uh, I was a real disaster of a. It's funny, and this is one of the reasons why my heart goes out. You know, you have a lot of awkward encounters to pe- with people at uh, science fiction and fantasy conventions. Fandom can be socially awkward at times. And my heart goes out to them uh, when I have those encounters because uh, that was always my experience, too. I didn't learn how to properly socialize. I was that kind of nerd that could find one, maybe two equally, you know, um, equal misfits to uh, game with in my mom's basement, literally in my mom's basement. That's not a, not a cliche. And it wasn't until college, really, or like late high school, that I started learning the basic social skills that I needed to just get along in a room without people thinking I'm an asshole. Although, frankly, I, I wager some people still think I'm an asshole when I when I try to get along <laughs> in a room, right? But the thing that the thing that's fascinating about it in hindsight is it made for a tough adolescence, but it's made for I think a much more empathetic adulthood, in the respect that I understand that. Those kinds of social skills that people who have, uh, how do I say this, more engaged up families during their upbringings, you know, they have a smoother, easier time with this stuff. Because the truth is, it's not intuitive. It's not even instinctive. You, Someone's got to teach you. And if, and if nobody teaches you, the only way you can learn is by going out there and making mistakes. And sometimes those mistakes can be pretty isolating, especially when you're young. Yeah. 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 Um, so I, I'm assuming that you joined the military um, after after high no, school. No, I, my, my no. My story is backwards. Um, I, <laughs> I actually I went and got a master's degree in museum studies in material culture at the George Washington University. Like you do. Yeah, you know, like you do. Well, my mom was pretty famous in the museum field. If you if you work in in um, in museums, you, you probably know who my mom is. Um, and, uh, so I, you know, followed in her footsteps and got my master's degree in museum studies and then, you know, went to work in that. And then I wanted to get married and realized that, you know, if I worked in museums, I would never make any money. And this was right when the tech boom happened. So I went into tech, um, to make money so that I could, uh, you know, be a provider and, and I don't know, do right by the woman I wanted to marry at the time. And what, um, what happened of course was 9-11. And tech wound up getting me um, a very high level security clearance because I think what a lot of people don't understand is that spy agencies clear, you have to have high level security clearances. If you're a janitor or a cafeteria worker at the CIA, you have to have a clearance because, you know, you may see things or hear things that are classified. So these right. very, very difficult to get and very, very and, – and, and when you have a clearance, it raises your um, salary enormously because it's so hard to get um, and you become so valuable by virtue of having it. So you have these really, really high-paid people in, in what you would consider to be low functions in these places. So I wound up as a computer guy getting this high-level clearance. But once I was in, I realized that intelligence agencies don't care about your job skills. They care about your clearance. So once, you, uh-huh. so once you're in, you're in. And I, we, we call it um, your tickets in the business. So I was thinking, well, heck, why would I want to be an IT guy when I could be a spy? So I took at the time I was, uh, you know, after 9-11, there were all these crazy, um, well, I mean, they call them private military contractors. But the truth is, it's a nice way of saying mercenary, right? Um, there are all these right. private armies that, you know, the public kind of went insane and started allowing all kinds of shit that frankly could, shouldn't be allowed, which is, you know, private armies to, to do our work. So I was working for one of those at the time and I asked around and another one 
you know, and they, they didn't, wouldn't move me from IT into ops. And then another one of the companies was like, will you take a $27,000 a year pay cut? And, and thinking I would say no. And I was like, hell yeah, I will. And so I went <laughs> to a private mercenary boot camp. It was retrained. Um, and it's a lot like what you think of from the military. In fact, I'd argue we probably got better training. We certainly got better equipment. Um, and it was done modularly. But you learn the stuff that you think. You know, you learn tactical driving and surveillance and counter surveillance and gunfighting and hand-to-hand -hand fighting and explosives and all that stuff. And um, one of the things that both military and private military organizations understand is that if, if, if you can get a trainee to trust the process and just have faith in the training – that you can transform anybody from anything into anything. And I, so yeah, I was absolutely a scrawny nerd when I went in there. And, but I, I guess partly because I'd been playing role playing games my whole life and pretending to be someone else, right? I was able to kind of lie to myself and pretend that I was a tough guy that I wasn't. But the training works and I emerged from that crucible transformed and transformed into someone who could really do the work. So, the irony is I went to Iraq on my first two tours as a private contractor, as a mercenary. My first tour as a targeting officer and my second tour as a custodial debriefer, which is a nice way of saying an interrogator. And then um, uh, after that, I kind of like started to feel bad because I realized I was part of, you know, look, I love the people I work with. I love the companies I work for, but they're war profiteering organizations, right? They, they, the companies I work for have a vested interest in keeping conflicts going because if people stop fighting, then they have no money, right? They have no business. Right. So uh, it's no money in peace. So I started to feel really, really bad about that, and I um, I looked around for ways to go federal, and um, and that led to two things. One, I took yet another pay cut. Another massive pay cut. So I'm like the only guy who has my career advances, my salary decreases. Um, I'm seeing a trend right. here. And I, and I became a, a civilian, you know, federal intelligence officer with the uh, DIA. The DIA is like the CIA, except that the CIA is super secret and everybody's heard of them. And the DIA is not secret and nobody's heard of them. And, um, <laughs> and I was a, an intelligence officer. My job was to break the laws of other countries and steal their shit. And, um, but the other thing I did was I decided I would join the military. Um, no one in my family, uh, with the exception of one black sheep uncle, because my grandparents were Soviet communists, we were Jews, you know, you didn't join the military. It wasn't what nice boy, nice Jewish boys did. So, um, I wanted to fix that. I wanted to rub that stain off my family's legacy. So I looked around at where to join. And like most people, I hadn't even known that the Coast Guard was the military. But I decided I wanted to pick the most elite, the most difficult organization to get into. And imagine my shock when I discovered in my research that isn't the Marine Corps. It's the Coast Guard. They're much smaller. They have much, much higher rates of applicants because people who think who want to join the military but think by some magical way that the Coast Guard isn't really the military. It is. Um, that it'll be easier. Uh, apply there. And, uh, yeah, I got in. And so I did it all backwards. I started as a as a as a private military contractor, a mercenary, and I wound up a federal civilian spy and um, military officer. That's absolutely amazing. You could not write that story. Yeah, I mean, it is, when I think back on it, it's pretty bizarre. <laughs> but, like, the thing I think that's cool about it is it's like everybody's story in the respect that it's totally flailing. Like, I had no idea what I was doing. Like, I just kind of put one foot in the other throughout life, and it did take me some pretty extraordinary places, and I'm really... I'm amazed myself when I think on it. Yeah, I'm, I always love to ask uh, that question. You know, how did you, what did you decide to do uh, for a career before you started writing? Because a lot of times, uh, that is more important than a lot of the, lot of the decisions that you make when you're quote, you know, a, a real writer. Um, because the, those life experiences that you pick up along the way, like you said, when you're just flailing around, uh, sometimes make us, uh, you know, be able to tell the stories that we never would couldn't, able couldn't to agree more. And I'm sure you've heard this advice yeah. before that, uh, actually there's a couple of quotes I want to give here. One is from Ron Collins, who's a deeply gifted short story writer. I don't know if he's had a novel out, but he's one of the analog mafia. And he says, and I'll never forget this, that writers have to live life like they're hunting it. 
which I, I think mm. that's magnificent. Um, and I couldn't yeah. agree more. And then the, um, the other quote, and this is a, a romantic quote, but it applies to writing. Um, you know, if, if you, when I have friends who moan, you know, oh, you know, I, I can't get a girlfriend, I can't find love, my, my immediate response is if you want to share an amazing life with someone, the first thing you need to do is have an amazing life. And uh, I think the right. same is true for writing. Um, and I also want to point out uh, my friend Mike Livingston. This is the guy. He's got three books with Tor, of the, of the, the Shards of Heaven series. Um, and he's the guy who's coming with me to Greece and has been really, really instrumental in helping me with my military history project for Osprey. He is a professor of, of English at the Citadel, which is one of America's premier military academies. Um, and he's one of the world's leading experts in medieval warfare. In fact, he wrote the definitive work on the Battle of Crecy, which upset hundreds of years of scholarship. And, and like it doesn't take a, a huge stretch of the imagination to understand how his background in academia and his experience as a professor and a historian has enabled him to write the, the books he has, the, the fiction books he has. Wow. Um, when you were pursuing this uh, circuitous route uh, to uh, that got you where you are now, were you were you thinking about writing and storytelling along the way? Um, you know, as, as you're uh, as you're working in in the museum uh, industry and pursuing your career and and uh, in IT and then you know finally to military and paramilitary, um, you know, was the storytelling bug that you had gotten as a kid? Did that uh, hang on, you know, along with uh, yes, but not in the way you think. When you talk about it as yeah. the storytelling bug, it almost makes it sound like the the technicality of telling great stories and the the sense of resonance and wonder that you get from reading is the thing that sticks with you. And it it may very well be for a lot of writers, but it would, never was for me. For me, I've always been one of those people who's been externally motivated, and I beat myself up for this for a long time where I really thought that that was a failing as a writer. And it's only recently that I've come to accept that it's just how I'm wired. I don't like writing. I like having written. I like what, what stuck with me was going into bookstores and seeing the rows of books on the shelves and thinking, I want to come in here and see my own name. And that's a, a motivator to me. And I have heard lots of people and I, understand why and I say it myself that this is not a very good motivator and that it's easy to become discouraged and easy to you know let quality slack when your motivation is extrinsic like that that you're reward motivated instead of being motivated by the work itself and that it's easy to burn out but I would and I, and, and I there's actually a lot of truth to that but I would be lying if I said that I was motivated by the puzzle of telling a great story I really wasn't I was motivated by the by the red hot desire to walk into Barnes and Noble and Borders and see my name in the stacks um, and and ha and <laughs> say I'm a writer. The title, the the knowing, the achievement, the knowing that I pulled it off. And look, man, I mean, if that's not a legitimate motivator, well, it worked for me. <laughs> so. <laughs> I, I, and I, I fully understand that. And uh, some people love the process of their fingers on the keyboards, you know, or or you know, writing it out longhand. Um, uh, you know, some days I don't love that, and I, I know exactly what you mean. You need to, uh, you know, you need to kind of have a vision out there that you're that you're looking toward that gets you through the the doldrums of writing. Sometimes well, I, I completely understand. I want to point out what you said though, because you you used a very important term, which is sometimes. I don't like that. And, and, and what right. I love about that is that you're nodding your head to the fact that the experience isn't monolithic. There are, right. when, I'm, when I say that this is how I'm motivated, it really what I'm speaking about is the majority of my motivation. The truth is I do have days where I take pride in the puzzle aspect of it and where I'm motivated by the work itself. But it's just that those days are a lot rarer than the days when I'm motivated about, you know, the, the positive feedback I'm going to get when I announce a book deal on Twitter. Right. <laughs> and, and some days the, uh, you know, just kind of uh, leaning back in, in my writing chair and, and, and rocking in it while I kind of work through the story and, uh, and, and kind of dream it out. Uh, sometimes those are the best. And, and then, you know, making it come out in the keyboard is, is the drudgery of it. 
Um, you know, but there, there's all different stages of it that, that mean something different to us along. Uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, look, I, the other thing too, is that for me, I think a lot of people look, it's hard to find meaning in life, right? I think most people go through their lives never really knowing what they're here to do, you know, and never really understanding it. And so what do you do? You work a job, you know, I think a lot of people find that missing meaning in family, you know, that you're here to raise children. Yeah, you may not like your job, but, you know, it's it's taking care of your of your spouse and your children, and that fills your life with meaning, and, and, and it's what, you know, you you take to bed at, uh, at night when you stare into the shadows over your ceiling and, and wonder, you know, what it is you're here to do. And that is wonderful, and I am in awe of people and very jealous of people who can do that. But, you know, I'm 43, and uh, I don't think that's going to materialize for me. So, I mean... Who knows? It may, but at least that's not my gut sense of how my life is going to play out. So I, you got to ask yourself, well, why are you here? What are you doing? And if I don't have that that um, that you know sense of mission that family and, and home and hearth provide, I want to mark the world in some other significant way. And the truth is, is that I have a venue to do that, the venue of law enforcement and intelligence, no longer the military for me. Um, where I really can have major impact and, and, and change the world in a, in a good way. But the truth is, is that military and, and government systems are devised specifically to make people fungible so that, you know, anyone can slot in and do your job, no matter how complex and intricate it may be. No one is irreplaceable. And, um, and that's as it should be. But art, art is singular. Art is unique. Nobody, lots of people can write books. But I'm the only person in the world who can write my books. And um, that is really something you can take to the bank. So for me, that keeps you motivated because writing is a it's a purpose. Well, and and not only that, but, you know, you've got the uh, the the kind of big picture things that you're talking about with military and with law enforcement um, may impact the world. Uh, you know, in a in a very real and tangible way, but you may not be dealing with people on a deeply personal level, whereas storytelling can, you can get right down and actually affect someone in particular's life. Yeah, for sure. And, and, and also get feedback. I mean, we had a, a, a we had a, um, a, a sign, a, like a poster that hung up in um, the ready room at us Coast Guard station, in New York, where I was the commanding officer of the reserves. And um, it said uh, where success is invisible and failure is unforgettable. And uh, it was so true. The reality of it was, was that when we did well, when we saved lives, you know, when we did what we were there to do, people didn't know. You know, when people knew that we had done a good thing, it was it was because it was in the news because we screwed up. Right. Um, <laughs> right. So. And look, here's the thing about art. Maybe this sounds like egot- egotism, but I'll take it. Um, it's that, you know, when I write a book. Man, people tell me what they think of it. You know, I can see the, the ripples of my impact in the world. The same way I imagine parents feel when they see their children, you know, growing up the way and, and reflecting their influence. Um, I, I'm sure what I do is kind of a hollow imitation of that. But, you know, when I get an email from a fan in Nepal telling me what they think of my story, it's pretty damn sublime. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so, at what point uh, did you decide to uh, to kind of jump in and start writing your first book? Oh man, I mean, I uh, high school probably. I mean, I guess there's a point at which I became serious, literally, like started right. giving up nights and weekends um, to write books, and, and that was 15 years before I sold my first one. So, I want to say when I was still in college. Uh, early grad school. Um, yeah, uh, that's when I started literally, you know, not going out. And, uh, and you know, it was in fits and starts and, you know, it lapsed at times. But though that was the period of time where I was making sacrifices and I started reading differently then, right? I started re- reading right. critically instead of, and it, and it cost me because I no longer got that sense of transportation and I frankly still don't when I read fantasy and science fiction. But I did start reading technically, kind of the same way that a, 
a boxer watches a fight video with, uh, you know, the, his opponent he's about to go up against. Um, and that's when things really started to change. That's a, a, a great thing that you bring out because, uh, you know, when you are, um, when you read to study the craft and there comes a point, uh, when you're a writer that everything you pick up, uh, you're kind of picking apart a little bit. You start trying to reverse engineer people's stories and things like that. And, uh, and it's very easy to lose the love of reading, um, for reading sake and to, like you said, to get transported somewhere. And, uh, uh, is that, uh, is it something that you still struggle with? Yes. Now? Um, and in fact, not only is it something I struggle with, every major writer I know has, has said the same thing to me without being prompted which tells me that it's a universal experience. I've heard this from Brent. I've heard this from Brent Weeks. I've heard this from Peter V. Brett. I've heard this from Joe Abercrombie. Uh, I've heard it from almost everybody. I think I've heard it from Scott Lynch. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I think, and, and I mourn it. I know I talked to Pete. Peter V. Brett is the author of The Demon Cycle. Uh, the first book in that series is The Warded Man. It's available on Del Rey. Amazing writer. Also my dearest friend, best friend since high school. Um, you know, we both talk about how, how mournful that is and how stressful that is for us, that we really can't just get lost in a book anymore. It, I mean, it's not monolithic like everything else we've discussed. We have moments where we break free of it. But by and large, yeah, I think that um, how I read is changed probably forever. Wow. Well, I'm not the only one. I'm glad to hear <laughs> Well, you know, that, that means... Uh... <laughs> Honestly, though, if you, if you want to take it as a sign of encouragement, that tells me that you're doing it right. Right, right. And you, the you know, the danger is you become that guy that uh, you know when when you're watching a uh, a movie with um, you know with friends or family or whatever, and you're like, well, here goes the third act. You can see that, you know. And you know, actually, like, this, this is funny. Pete, Pete, ask Pete if you ever have him on the show. Uh, I hope you will someday. Uh, ask him about me and history, like. He cannot stand anytime, you know, anytime we watch anything that involves a historical battle or historical armor. Right. Like I, I am so completely insufferable. And, and isn't that isn't that like a universal nerd experience? I bet everybody in your yeah. audience listening right now is nodding because like we oh, yeah. all do that. Whatever our expertise is, be it cars or planes or medieval warfare or guns or whatever it is, we always have something to say. And our, our non-nerd friends are always like, will you just shut up? <laughs> Yeah, could, could I just enjoy this movie for once? No, he got it wrong. You don't understand. Exactly right. It's totally true. Talk, talk about oh, a universal man. experience. Exactly. Um, so what was that first book that you got published? So my first book that I got published was called Control Point. And that was with Ace Rock. It was the first book in my military fantasy Shadow Ops trilogy. The three books in that are Control Point, Fortress Frontier, and Breach Zone. But that was the fourth book draft and when i say fourth draft i mean that novel was burned down to the studs and completely rewritten so much so that i counted as four different books uh, over the course of wow. 15 years um and uh, it was the first book that i ever finished and presented to someone i trusted in this case pete and that they came back to me and said you really have something like uh not i, I think pete knew even back then that that iteration of the book wasn't good enough but he was able to say to me you can't, if you want to, you can be a writer. And I think that that, that was kind of a, a watershed moment for me. Now, what I love about um, that part of your story is that um, uh, you hung with the story. You believed in the story enough uh, that you kept reworking it until you got it right. So many times I hear people say, well, I wrote a novel and I knew it wasn't good enough. So I put that novel in a desk drawer and I wrote something completely different. And I kept trying that until one day I was, you know, a real novelist. I, I put in the work and the time. Uh, rarely do you hear someone say, you know what? I had an idea and I believed in this idea enough that I was going to keep working at it until I got it right. Yeah, but, but mine a special case because if folks who know my original shadow op series know that it's it's modern magic in the military so it's it's as if harry potter joined the navy seals instead of going to hogwarts and i knew that no one else in the field was doing that i also knew that no one else in the field had the active service background either in as a private military contractor as an intelligence officer whatever to make it ring authentic and so i knew that i was onto something that 
I could make good from a craft perspective. It wasn't there yet, but from an idea perspective, it was truly special. Um, so I, that's definitely a big motivator in my choice to stick with it. Well, back up and run over the premise of that book again for people that may not have quite captured what you said. So the idea is that um, our world, it's, it's urban fantasy, contemporary fantasy, and I got in just under the wire before that market totally collapsed for being oversaturated. Um, I, um, and it's uh, that magic comes back into the world, and a very small portion of the population can channel that magic and use it to you know, cast spells. And um, so the but of course, like mutants in the X-Men, not everybody can control it. It's extremely dangerous. And so the government clamps down on it and makes it, uh, you know, there's a few options you can have. You can go into a government monitoring program in the National Institute of Health. You can um, join the Marine Corps in a suppression lance where your magic is suppressed and you can't rise above the rank of sergeant. Or, and this is what they really want you to do, you can join the Supernatural Operations Corps, the SOC and become a government sanctioned sorcerer or a military sorcerer. And, you know, you do military operations and use your magic for that. The one thing you, the one thing you must not do and cannot do is become a selfer. And a selfer is someone who refuses to submit to government monitoring and control. And instead they take their magic and run. And if you do that, the government hunts you down and kills you. Um, and uh, obviously that's a, a, a core point of the story where, our, our protagonist, who has been all his life a G-man who's, you know, done what the government expects and, and you know, been a good little boy. And uh, one day he comes up latent uh, with late magical ability. And more importantly, the magical ability that he manifests is a what's called a probe or a prohibited school of magic. So he can't join the army, even if he wants to. His only choice is to run. And, you know, wackiness ensues. You know, when I first uh, heard of Shadow Ops, I thought, well, you know, this is an odd uh, kind of combination, but very intriguing. And and then you pick it up and you're like, wow, this is really good. I wonder how someone could pull this off. And then after talking to you, I I mean, how could you not write that book? Right. So this is my exact (laughs) – this is like – so people – I'm so glad you said that because so many people are like, you know, how did you, isn't, you know, don't you think sometimes it's odd that you came up with this idea? And I always go, no, I think it's inevitable that I came up with this idea. Like, how can I not come up with this idea? So I think you're exactly right. Yeah. Th- this idea had to be written by you. I, right. You've got a, you know, you've got a, a, a D and D nerd, uh, who, you know, becomes, you know, a, 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 a private military, uh, you know, mercenary, and that's that's it had to come out. Yeah, right. that, yeah, I totally think that's right. It was inevitable. Yeah, what was the uh, the reaction to the book? You, you said that you reworked it four times, but when you, um, you know, when you finally got it into the into the shape it needed to be in, and then into the hands of the people that needed to publish it, kind of what was their reaction to it? So I was rejected by every publisher in the English speaking world. Um, no nice. one wanted the book, and this is after I got Joshua Billman's who is Brandon Sanderson's agent, Charlene Harris right. of True Blood fame. So, so Joshua is what we call, the technical term is a big swing and dick. Like Joshua, when Joshua walks into a publisher's office, they see money. Like this is a man who, do, he's a kingmaker. So yeah. I thought for sure, I thought for sure, he's representing me. I am done. I'm in. There's nothing more <laughs> I need to do. This book will sell. And as, you know, six months turned into a year and there were, and then a year to a year and a half and the rejections piled up, this inflated sense of entitlement I had um, just curdled and I turned into a monster. Um, I, I don't even recognize myself. I was such a horrible person. Um, I'm able to be sympathetic, uh, not really, uh, to a lesser degree now as I look back on, you know, the, the, the pressure I was putting myself under, but I was just such an entitled little shit. And I, um, I just, uh, I just handled it really, really poorly. Now, part of it was I'd come back from war. I had lost my fiance because, you know, she'd come for a comedy. She got a drama, right? I went off to Iraq. I came back changed. She didn't want to have anything to do with it anymore. Um, so I had this, you know, I felt like the universe owed me, right? I risked my life. I suffered this great emotional loss. I gotten this big agent, you know, for sure. I, I get a book deal. You know, the universe owes me a book deal. But you know what? The universe doesn't owe you shit. And um, I have a tattoo around my forearm that says the sea doesn't care about you. 
And uh, it's a Coast Guard Navy saying. And um, But I have that there permanently inked on my skin for a reason, because I definitely need to look down on it uh, the next time I feel like I have, you know, something in the bag. The universe owes me nothing. It only will give me what I earn, and sometimes not even that. So uh, I got lucky is that Ace Rock, uh, Ann Sowards at Ace Rock, said she would consider the manuscript again if I did a, if I fixed this, this, and this. And fixing this, this, and this was like a 70% rewrite. And I, and I thought, and I did it in a funk. I thought for sure. You know, look, if, if I had like 13 shots to sell this thing and I couldn't do it with Joshua Vilma's at my back, I'm certainly not going to do it with one shot, right? Um, so I wrote it. And uh, amazingly enough, Ann Sowards picked it up, and uh, the rest is history. Wow. And there were three books in that original trilogy? Three books in that original trilogy. Um, Control Point, uh, to my enduring shame, it's my most flawed one. Um, I think a lot of people, like uh, Peter Brett is, another, is a great example of this. The Warded Man, you know, fans can differ on this, but I really feel like The Warded Man is his finest book, his first book. He came out like a rocket. It's so amazing, that book. And, um, you know, I feel like my first really good book was my second one, Fortress Frontier. I almost wish that I could reorder the series and have my fans read that first. Control Book is a, is a good book. It's got a lot to recommend it, and I'm certainly not ashamed of it. Uh, but there are, are, but, you know, from the feedback I've gotten from fans and from how it's impacted my reader's experience, there are definitely places in that book where I wish I could go back and zig when I instead zagged. Um, you spent, well, you obviously spent much less time, uh, on the second book than you did the first book. Um, how do you think that works out? You know, that I've heard other authors say that, you know, that the, um, uh, that first book, I worked it and worked it and worked it and worked it and we finally got it out there and it was good. But man, that second one that I, you know, obviously didn't spend 15 years writing, uh, you know, was better. Do you think that it just, um, that you had kind of discovered yourself uh, after the process, or maybe uh, you kind of understood the characters and the settings and all of that better the second time around. What do you think it is about that sophomore effort uh, that sometimes is easier and kind of resonates more truly? So this is a fascinating question, and it's one that I have uh, contemplated a lot. I'm really glad you asked it. All I can tell you is what my experience is. And you, and this is actually kind of where you, Hank, have a really cool advantage because you've interviewed, I mean, shoot, I looked at your lineup for this show. You've interviewed Anne Rice. You've interviewed Pat Rothfuss. I mean, you've interviewed the, a, a veritable who's who in the genre. And you ask them similar questions because this podcast focuses on how to write and what the writing life is. So you're in a cool position to hear my input and judge it in the context of all those other inputs. So here's what my experience is. I feel like every time I write a book, it's my first book. I feel like I haven't learned a damn thing. I feel like I don't know anything. I've forgotten what little I thought I knew. And every time I write a book, I think it sucks, whether it's good or whether it's bad. And yet, every book I write, I write faster. And every book I write, with one exception, is better than the one before it. Um, so I never feel like I'm getting better. I never feel like my craft is improved. And um, I never, and it's never easier. It never feels easier to me. But I can't deny that the writing is better and the books are written faster. So what I, all I can say is that I can only assume that there is a learning process and a skill development process occurring because what other explanation could there possibly be? Or perhaps a, uh, uh, an impact on my writing that my increasing confidence is having, um, but that I can't consciously be aware of it, that it's happening entirely subconsciously. And But that is just a guess. The truth is, I don't know what's happening. And like most writers, I live in fear that the next book, that's going to be the one where my editor points at me and goes, I don't know what the fuck I was thinking. <laughs> when I write and this is indicative of imposter syndrome, and I'm sure you've heard lots about imposter uh, syndrome from every writer oh, yeah. you've interviewed. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, yeah. No. Now, so let me ask you, Hank. Hearing me say that and having interviewed all these writers, does that – does my experience sound unusual? Oh, no, no. I'm sitting here nodding uh, because everybody, you know, at one point or another, uh, with the exception of – 
you know, a, a handful and, and you make it kind of peg that handful. Um, you know, just, you know, come to the keyboard at the beginning of a new book and go, oh my God, I have no earthly idea what I'm doing. And, uh, you know, there's this weird, I don't know if it's humility. I don't know if it's, uh, I don't know what it is, but it's this thing of, uh, you know, uh, and, and so many times people have said, you know, it was my fourth or fifth or sixth book until, you know, I quit looking over my shoulder, uh, wondering when they were going to come, you know, take my computer away because I'm a complete imposter. Um, so no, your, your experience is, is not singular at all. It's a, it's tends to be, uh, the norm for a lot of writers that's, for whatever reason. That's kind of a relief to hear. Um, I, <laughs> I also, I also want to say that I'm on my, let's see, I've published five books. I've turned in and will publish my sixth. My history book, I have a first draft written. So I have now written and or turned in something like seven or eight books. And it's not getting any better. It's not getting yeah. any better. I have a first draft of Queen of Crows, the Queen of Crows, which is the sequel to The Arm of Saint, which is the Tor.com Sacred Throne series. And I am terrified to send this to my editor, Justin Landon, because I think it sucks. <laughs> um, but eventually, eventually I can't just sit on it forever. I got to show it to him at some point and he's going to have to, hopefully he'll tell me that it doesn't suck. <laughs> well, you know, there, there's something crazy and, and you have to kind of, uh, you know, jokingly, uh, uh, you know, think it's uh, akin to some sort of mental illness um, that that we think that everything we do sucks completely. Uh, yet we sit down and keep doing it over and over again anyway. Um, you know, it's like the the person that you know, like you got rejected uh, how many by every English publisher. You said yet you kept doing it. Um, <laughs> you know, so what does that say about us as people? Well, I mean, at least for me, at least for me, again, I really feel like I was at least for me. I kind of knew that my life, and some of this is a rock. I, I did an article on PTSD. God, I wish my fiction was as popular as this article um, that I posted to my blog, and it got reprinted in Combat Stress Magazine. They're still using it, I know, in um, in uh, PTSD rehabilitation clinics in, uh, uh, I think, in Fort Bragg for special uh, special operations units. Um, and one of the things I said is that my experience of going to war and the, how PTSD impacted me, it wasn't flashbacks. It wasn't numbness um it was boredom and it was this kind of scouring away of all of the traditional life goals that i think most people use to chart the course of a life like i no longer wanted to buy a house and marry a woman and have a baby and so i needed something else right and i think just like a parent you know if a parent if a, if a couple decides that they're going to have children and they discover that the wife can't get pregnant they don't just throw up their hands, right? They get in vitro fertilization. And if that doesn't work, they adopt a kid. They're going to have a kid, right? No matter what. And I think this is the equivalent of that. I, I didn't have that family motive driving me forward. And I had to pick something else. And for me, it was writing. So, of course, I was going to keep at it, no matter how many rejections I got. It, uh, I think it says something about the indomitable spirit of the of the human, you know, that uh, that we are... Uh, you know, we press on, uh, no matter you know who tells us no. That the, there's just something about us that that pushes us forward. I mean, I love it when people tell me no. That's my favorite thing in the world. You know, I uh, it's <laughs> funny when I uh, when I first started out on this history project um, for Osprey. You know, I, I did this whole thing up, and uh, my agent told me he was like, "I don't know, man. Like, you don't have a PhD. You're not a history professor at a university. It's going to be really hard to sell this book." And that was the moment where I was like, oh, oh, is it? Is it going to be hard? All right, go, go ahead, go ahead. Tell me what I can't do. And uh, I think we're both pretty happy that, <laughs> that I was able to, you know, get across the finish line in that case. That's fantastic. Um, you, you said that when, uh, when you put Shadow Ops out, you barely got in under the line before uh, Urban Fantasy collapsed. Um, do you... Is that a thing? Like, is, is urban yep. fantasy kind of oversaturated? Yes, I totally think it is. Um, and, and I think there's a few things there. One is urban fantasy was hugely popular, and therefore publishers brought in a lot of urban fantasy authors. Um, right. And uh, how do you find out when, if a market's saturated? Your authors start to tank because there's, you know, the market's desire for new urban fantasy has been satiated. Um, and like any trend in art, 
people are interested in a thing for a while and then they stop being interested in it and it may come back around again. But, you know, um, there's only room for so many Patricia Briggs and only room for so many Jim Butchers and only room for so many Charlene Harris's. Um, so I think there's a huge glut of and, and remember, those authors are going to keep producing books. So uh, in the in the subgenres that they've come to define. Um, so it's tougher and tougher for a new author to get in. I think another factor here was that for for reasons I'm, I'm going to practice publishing without a license here. Um, I think that largely Ace Rock drove a lot. Of, they, they found a very profitable business model in doing direct to mass market paperbacks uh, of urban fantasy titles. And a lot of other publishers maybe picked up on that. But the mass market as a format, while it still exists, it's taken a huge hit. Um, and there was a big adjustment uh, from the rising prominence of the ebook before that um, meteoric rise stabilized. And as a result, I think a lot of publishers are pulling back from mass market. And I think that while it's certainly nothing inherent in urban fantasy that prevents a publisher from putting it out in hardback, it's really not how they think. And publishers are pretty conservative institutions. So I do think, look, you write an amazing urban fantasy book, an amazing contemporary fantasy book. I believe it will sell, even in this market, because great stuff sells. Um, but I do think that aspiring writers who are trying to get their first book deal, contemporary fantasy or urban fantasy right now, it may come around again right now, you're going to have a disadvantage, you know, from the start. Yeah. Uh, well, your new series uh, is not urban fantasy. Uh, you just signed a deal with Tor.com. Uh, tell me about, about this series. So this series is um, a really kind of brutalist, dark. Uh, you guys have heard the subgenre grimdark. Anytime you bring it up on Twitter, you get a bunch of people getting mad at you. Again, you know. <laughs> but I love it. Um, I love that genre. When I You hate people. Yeah. <laughs> um, I love people. I just hate lightness, joy, and, and fun of any of any kind. Um, but he, when I say grimdark, I mean the kind of bleak, brutalist um, trend in fantasy, which started, I think, with George R. R. Martin. But now we have Scott Lynch and Joe Abercrombie. I'd argue that Robin Hobbs uh, Assassin series is grimdark. A lot of people get mad at me when I say that, um, but it is super bleak. Uh, and um, I love that it re accurately reflects the horror of the world. Um, I mean, look, uh, I don't know what the politics of your listeners are. Anyone who follows me on Twitter knows that I really see um, the United States to currently be in a very serious crisis. Um, we live in hard times, man. And I don't feel like we've really had a break since 9-11. And so it's very difficult for me to read a fantasy that's upbeat and uplifting, something like Tolkien, which is kind of numinous. And while there's danger, you know, the, the, the main characters don't have any flaws any real flaws, flaws like the flaws right. I'm familiar with, right? Um, and so I, it's very difficult for me to get transported by that. But when I read something like A Song of Ice and Fire, um, these characters resonate and feel real to me, and therefore the risks they face feel real, and therefore the heroics they enact uh, are enormously real. And that fills me with the sense of redemption as possible and the sense of hope and wonder that I need from fantasy and so I've really wanted to enter into this subgenre for a long, long time. So um, the Sacred Thrones series is heavily, heavily influenced by that. It is anyone who's seen the cover can tell that it's heavily, heavily influenced by the dark, you know, grimness of the Warhammer 40,000 universe, uh, which is I've been uh, in love with both that gaming system and the fiction that Black Library publishes uh, for my, you know, my whole childhood till now, practically. And it's a. Uh, it's about religious tyranny. It's about, um, it's a young girl uh, in this uh, medieval world of the, of the book. There's a, a religious order that exists to root out and uh, kill wizards because wizardry can break the veil between our world and hell and let the devils into our world. And um, in order to eliminate any hint of wizardry, they rule with an iron fist and they enact all these draconian laws and like any kind of Sharia society, um, it, you know, it governs how you have sex and who you marry and whether or not you can read and the roles of girls versus boys and all this unnecessary oppression that we can see mimicked in um, the agenda of our own government today. And um, it's one little girl who decides that she doesn't want to live like that anymore and she's going to put a stop to it. 
But just because the order is draconian doesn't mean they're wrong. And um, so there's some surprises, uh, both for the protagonist and the reader, uh, as the book evolves. Um, I, I talked to Tad Williams uh, uh, a, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, we were talking about the uh, post-Tolkien world. And, and he had very similar uh, comments to yours about um, how Tolkien didn't really resonate with him. Uh, you know, Tolkien was writing about a very different world uh, than, than we have right now. And uh, maybe, you know, Tolkien had a very... Um, anti-progress uh kind of bent you know he he didn't or anti-modernism maybe is a is a better uh word and um uh and that yeah that that those uh his protagonists are very uh can be very mary sue-ish um but you know you, you talked about uh, finding redemption and finding hope uh in these very dark stories um as a writer um how do you tell a story that is so grim and so dark, uh, by your own admission, uh, but still leaves room for, uh, you know, the human spirit to come alive. Uh, I read Cormac McCarthy's The Road, and I read the last chapter again and again and again and again, and I try to do that. <laughs> um, it's hard. Uh, but the truth is, um, and this is the wonderful thing about being a writer, um, you know, every writing class I've ever been to has told you, steal your plots, steal your characters. Um, the way you, the way I do it is by imitation. I look at the people who have been able to evoke that in me. Um, Joe Abercrombie is the one writer I've ever read who can do grimdark with no hint of redemption. So it's almost like watching Requiem for a Dream. It's just a spiral, spiral, spiral crash and have it still be amazing. But he's the only writer. Uh, and look, I will freely admit I am no Joe Abercrombie. There's only one guy who writes like that, and that's him. Um, but what I do is I look at Scott Lynch, um, this incredibly bleak, you know, Lord of Chains, you know, orphans being raised up to be criminals. Um, I look at uh, George R. R. Martin, where you have this incredible scheming in the Lannister family and, uh, you know, the, the, the frivolous and callous taking of human life and, and where honorable people lose left and right. And I look for those flashes of hope and um I'll, I'll, so I don't have to spoil anything. I don't want to tell you the ending of the road. But uh, in the middle of, of Game of Thrones, The Song of Ice and Fire, you look at Tyrion, who is neglected by his father, rejected by his father, abused by everyone in his family, looked down upon for his physical disability, brought into a world that is innately hostile to him, merely by the fact that he was born a certain way. And you watch him find humor. You watch him find the capacity to love another human being, more than one other human being. You watch in him, even as he engages in Machiavellian scheming, even as he murders and makes decisions that bring about the, the ends of the lives of others and has realpolitik and, and, and nihilistic factors into his decision making, you see him love and hope and laugh and be the kind of person that you as the reader can root for. And... And you read it, and you read it again, and you keep reading it until you understand it, and then you try to imitate it. Yeah, and and he becomes one of the most beloved characters in, in the whole series. Look, George R. R. Martin's greatest triumph as a writer, in my opinion, was introducing me to Jamie Lannister, fucking his own sister, and pushing a child <laughs> and pushing a child out a window. And in the next book, after a few POV chapters, I want Jamie Lannister to win. <laughs> Right. Hank, that's a good writer. That's a good, that's a good writer. writer. Yeah. That's a good writer. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, Mike, we've been talking for uh, in, over an hour now, but um, you've got some other interesting projects coming up. And before we started recording, uh, you were rattling off, you know, just all this awesome stuff that that has come your way recently. Um, before we go, tell us a little bit. Uh, so you've got the new series with Tor uh, coming out. Uh, I believe the Armored Saint is up for pre-order right yep. now, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it sure is. We just did. Um, yep. If people want to see the cover, it's over posted on TheVerge.com, and there's a long interview about the book there. Awesome. And, but you've got some other great stuff coming up. Tell us a little bit about some of the history that you're writing. Right. So I'm doing a book for Osprey. This is the military history imprint of Bloomsbury. They do these awesome, highly illustrated uh, history books, military history books, aimed at the lay audience, which is to say they're history books, but they're not aimed at 
you know, people who are in university seriously studying history, um, certainly they have audiences there, but they're aimed at war gamers and history enthusiasts. And, and the effort is made to really write them in a way that if you don't know the topic, but you want to learn about, I don't know, English Longbowmen in the Hundred Years' War, you pick up an Osprey book and you walk away knowing. And they're highly, highly illustrated, which give you this almost as close as you can get to photograph of what people look like, what arms and armor look like, what formations look like, what clothing look like. And I grew up with these books and I have loved them. And um, in the Hellenistic period, which is the third and second centuries BC, around the death and after the death of Alexander the Great, the um, Hellenistic phalanx, think about the guys from 300, a bunch of guys with spears and shields, a Greek tradition, Macedonian tradition, um, an evolution of that went up against the Roman legion, a very different formation in six major battles. And no one, I was amazed to find, has written a study that looks at and asks that basic question, who would win in a fight and why? Um, so the book is going to be Legion versus Phalanx, and it's going to deep dive into those six battles, and it's going to look in great detail. And again, the goal of the book is going to be that if you know nothing about the topic and you're not a fan of history, you can pick it up and have a good time. I'm going to focus on the human drama. I'm going to focus on keeping narrative tension the same way I would in a novel. But it's also going to have first rate rigorous scholarship. Uh, and I'm heading off to Greece next week with Mike Livingston, who I've mentioned before, and Kelly DeVries, who is, uh, I believe I'd mentioned, one of the, the foremost historians in, in medieval warfare, to walk some of the battlefields down there. These two guys are top flight academics, and Mike, at least, is a top flight fiction writer as well. And they've kind of taken me under their wing, and they're helping to mentor me since I'm coming at this as a passionate amateur, and they're both lifelong professionals. I love it. Uh, Mike, if, if people uh, want to uh, to follow you, where they can uh, – is there a place online where they can get plugged into your work and uh, see what's coming up next? Yeah, the best place to start is on my website, which is mikecole.com. Keep in mind I spell it with a Y, so that's M-Y-K-E-C-O-L-E.com. You can follow me on Twitter at, at Mike Cole, spelled the same way. Or you can friend me on Facebook, Facebook yeah, facebook.com forward slash Mike Cole. Feel free to hit me up on my contact form or to at me on Twitter. I, I, uh, I'm I, very blessed to have a pretty good fan base, but it's not so massive that I can't respond to anybody, So to everybody. So please do feel, feel free to reach out. Love it. Thanks, Mike. Uh, we're going to send everybody over to uh, pre-order The Armored Saint uh, and uh, to pick up all your stuff. Thank you so much for taking time to come Thanks so much show. for having me. It's been a blast. Stay tuned now for a clip from the Jason Crane series by Richard Glebes. There's a link to the entire series in the show notes. As always, tune in every Tuesday and Friday for new episodes of the Author Stories Podcast. Find all of the archives at hankgarner.com. Now on to our clip from the Jason Crane series by Richard Gleaves. Hedwig slipped into David's den, the circular reading room. A ladder of crude rungs protruded from the wall, remnant of its days as a grain silo. He pulled himself upward, rung by rung, until the bookcases and sofas were far below. Even if he fell and died, he didn't really care anymore. No, he did care. He couldn't die yet. She had to die first. That would make their divorce final, if she wanted it so much. Darkness enveloped him. He reached the top of the ladder and stepped off onto a catwalk of black mesh, lit only by the faint light of the four square windows that encircled the turret. From this perch he could see the exit she would use. He felt like an assassin, like Lee Harvey Oswald in the window of the Texas School Book Depository. But he wouldn't use a rifle, no. Rifles leave evidence. Rifles can be produced in court. Rifles can miss. He pulled back a shroud of burlap and opened the cardboard box he'd stashed up here earlier that day. He reached into it and withdrew the only murder weapon, the only magic bullet a Van Brunt could ever need. The gold lantern flashed in the moonlight. He held it up to the window. One if by land, two if by sea, he thought, and then it's time for a midnight ride. But it won't be Paul Revere. No, not Paul Revere at all. He found the oyster knife at last. He lay his cupped palms sideways over the vent. Don't get blood on your Armani. And stabbed the blade into his palm. The blood came hot. He dripped it into the lantern, where the skull of the horseman waited to sip it like nectar. The reliquary glowed, 
and an incantation in Old Dutch appeared, shining from within the metal. It was time. Hedwig bent and whispered into the vents. Rise, headless, and ride. The letters vanished, and a cold white light burst from the thing. The skull wasn't just a skull anymore. It had gestated. Capillaries clung to it the way fine hair clings to the crown of a newborn. A thick, carotid artery moved with snake-like undulation, drinking blood from the pool at the base, pulling it upwards to circulate through scarlet vessels, through twisting coils, slurping the liquid greedily, the way little Zeph used to slurp strawberry Nesquik through a crazy straw. The blood pulsed and pushed into the nose, into the eyes, into the hollow cavity within the skull. But was it hollow, still? Hedwig didn't think so. He felt a mind growing there, something with a will to challenge his own. He fixed his gaze to the twin caverns of its eye sockets, speaking slowly and deliberately. Jessica Bridge. The death's head grin broadened, somehow, and a thread of black and green liquid, shiny as a horsefly's wings, trickled from the gap of a missing eye tooth. Only Jessica Bridge. Do you understand? He shook the lantern. Do you understand? The face lurched forward and struck the glass, leaving a red splash there. It wobbled and settled, smiling and nodding. Jessica Bridge, hissed the face. Yes. Hedwick raised the lantern a little. Jessica Bridge. The red face tipped backwards and the jaw cracked wide. Hedwick recoiled. Something pink and wet writhed inside that mouth, the nub of a new tongue, salivating as if it could taste the name. Jessica Bridge. Jessica Bridge. Jessica Bridge.